Today we are looking, at, tonight as I say, we are looking at Psalms 136. And Psalms 136 is a psalm that has um, a rhythm to it. Now you guys remember when we went through Psalms 119, the longest uh, chapter in the Bible, and mm-hmm. how each one of those verses had some kind of uh, mention or some kind of uh, uh, allegorical reference to the Word of God in every verse. And, we, we, and our, our, uh, 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 our track of trying to find each one of them was part of what we were doing. We're trying to say, well, in each verse, can we see where it uh, references the Word of God? Well, in Psalm 136, we're doing something similar with the, with the aspect of God's mercy. God's mercy is awesome. And when we go through the psalm, I think we'll get a, a heightened understanding of the mercy of God. One of the most uh, famous gospel songs that have ever been written and has been sung by so many people is Amazing Grace. And that is great uh, that that is so recognized because God's grace is amazing. And it is <laughs> Uh, just, you know, grace is something when you get something you do not deserve. But if you go through scripture, you'll often find that grace is always usually accompanied by mercy, his grace and mercy. And that's an important aspect. And you almost kind of want to know that, that, you know, mercy should have a song <laughs> that makes it just as popular as the grace. But I think we do understand. I think we do know and we do get the fact that God's um, mercy is just phenomenal. All right, good to see you, Wayne. And, and so uh, we're in Psalms 136. And so the, the beauty of the understanding of the, 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 um, the mercy of God it's going to be brought forth and outlined here uh, just a bit, and we'll get a chance to talk uh, about it and kind of elaborate on how wonderful it is. Now, I think we all know God's mercy is great. <laughs> we, that's not something I need to, you know, this is not a secret. This isn't like a, 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 a spoiler alert. We all know that God is merciful. But what we also sometimes can forget is how deep his mercy goes. How merciful is he? Yeah, and that's one of the things that I think we'll try to point out uh, on this evening. Um, so let's go ahead and uh, let's get the reading in before we uh, uh, do any more elaboration. Uh, let's take a listen here. Psalms 136. Time for an heritage. Chapter 136. Let me start from the beginning. Chapter 136. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercies endureth forever. O oh, give thanks unto the God of gods, for his mercy endureth forever. O oh, give thanks to the Lord of lords, for his mercy endureth forever. To him who alone doeth great wonders, for his mercy endureth forever. To him that by wisdom made the heavens, for his mercy endureth forever. To him that stretched out the earth above the waters, for his mercy endureth forever. To him that made great lights, for his mercy endureth forever. The sun to rule by day, for his mercy endureth forever. The moon and stars to rule by night, for his mercy endureth forever. To him that smote Egypt in their firstborn, for his mercy endureth forever. And brought out Israel from among them, for his mercy endureth forever. With a strong hand and with a stretched out arm, for his mercy endureth forever. To him which divided the Red Sea into parts, for his mercy endureth forever, and made Israel to pass through the midst of it, for his mercy endureth forever. But overthrew Pharaoh and his host in the Red Sea, for his mercy endureth forever. To him which led his people through the wilderness, for his mercy endureth forever. To him which smote great kings, for his mercy endureth forever, and slew famous kings, for his mercy endureth forever. Sihon, king of the Amorites, for his mercy endureth forever, and Og, the king of Bashan, for his mercy endureth forever. 
and gave their land for an heritage, for his mercy endureth forever, even an heritage unto Israel his servant, for his mercy endureth forever, who remembered us in our low estate, for his mercy endureth forever, and hath redeemed us from our enemies, for his mercy endureth forever, who giveth food to all flesh, for his mercy endureth forever. O oh, give thanks unto the God of heaven, for his mercy endureth forever. All right, here we go. Now, chapter 136. Now, we'll stop that. Now, just in case you didn't know, God's mercy endureth, endureth forever. And I think this points it out. The concept of God's mercy, um, and we're going to hit that phrase that we see in every verse. All right, and then you're gonna, we're going to learn to apply that to each of these things that we see here. So, but let's look at the first verse, and, and then we'll bring out that endures forever piece, um, uh, uh, which will apply to every verse. So we won't have to repeat that. So it says, oh, give thanks. So we're thanking God for his mercy. Okay, what is mercy? Mercy is you're not going to get judgment that you deserve. You're not going to get punishment. You're not going to have to pay for any wrong. You're not going to have to pay for any debt. You're not going to have to pay for any shortcoming. You're not going to be uh, anything that you fall short or have blame for. It's no longer going to, going to be accounted to you. You're good. So that means your sins. God's going to show you mercy on your sin. You're not going to get the punishment of sin. The Bible says... The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life. So you're not going to get it. You're not going to, to the, the uh, spiritual jailhouse to pay your debt. That's the beauty of it. So that's why we give thanks. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord. For he is good. All right. And so the fact that God is good means that everything that he does ultimately works for the benefit of those that, that follow him. We're going to see that in a minute when we talk about his servants. All right? And then it says, for his mercy endureth forever. Now, let's pause and let's deal with this because this is applying to each and every one of these verses here. That endureth forever aspect means that he's not going to change his mind. He's not going to retry you. All right? You you remember um uh, they, uh remember that O.J. Simpson uh, thing not you know not even to say whether he was guilty or innocent but remember he was found innocent though whether he was guilty or not that's not the, my point all right but they they uh they found him the jury found him what innocent and he was set free right well he got retried how on a civil trial. All right, so he was, in, he was in a criminal trial first, but now he's in a civil trial. They got to retry him, and in the civil trial, he was found guilty. Now, guess what? If man can think of a variety of ways to, to say, well, you know, you got a way, but we're going to create it. We're going to find another way. We're going to go through all the little loopholes, all the laws, and we're going to find another way to retry you. Man can do that. But guess what? God's not going to do that. God's not going to say, well, you, were, you know, Jesus, Jesus died for your sins, uh, but I'm going to find another way to find guilt. That is not something that God will ever do. You can rest assured, and I see somebody that just joined, we're on Psalms 136. Uh, you can rest assured that when God applies mercy to you, it endureth forever. God is not going to wake up and change his mind. You know, you ain't got to worry about, well, I want if I go to bed tonight and wake up tomorrow, if God's mercy has changed, it does not. God does not change in his aspect of what he has promised. And if he has given you mercy, the scripture says he's thrown your sins where? In the sea of forgetfulness. In, in, into the sea of forgetfulness. So when we look at each one of these particular aspects about mercy, now you can take a look at it and go, wow, can I shine this light on me? Remember, the word of God is like a, a, a lamp unto our feet. It's, it's also like a mirror. You will see the ways of God, but you will also see your ways. The more you see God, the more you also will see how short uh, your actions are, how, how inaccurate your thinking can be. 
The more you see God, the, the greater you see your own shortcomings. And you begin to thank God even more because you realize that God has forgiven you and has shown mercy for you, on you time and time again. Um, and that's something that we can always rejoice in. That's why we always will give thanks. And this thing, this, this, ver this verse, or I should say this chapter, starts off with this aspect of giving thanks. So verse 1 starts off, Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. God cannot do wrong. It's always going to be for your benefit if you are his servant. Okay? And his mercy will endure. You're not going to have to pay for your sins. Jesus did it. God's not going to change his mind either. All right, look at verse 2. Oh, give thanks unto God, unto, uh, unto the God of gods. Now, what does this mean? It's stating that God is going to be merciful to you, and because he is the God of gods, who is going to force his hand to change his mind? Who is going to, going to bully God to make God change how he decided to show mercy to you or to me or to anybody? So we can give thanks because if God is showing mercy, nobody, no angel, no devil, no man, no king, nobody can make God take back his mercy that he has given to you. So if you've got God's mercy, you can thank God. That's why it says, oh, give thanks unto the God of gods for his mercy endureth forever. How long? Forever. <laughs> Look at verse 3. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord of lords. Okay? Now, you want to look at rulers, people who, uh, uh, that follow other people. The aspect of Lord is somebody that people will see and want to follow, want to listen to. That's why Jesus said, Why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not what I say? When God is your Lord, he is your instructor. But then he is the Lord of lords. Anybody that's trying to say, well, I'm a governor and I can give rules or I'm a king and I can give, give rules or I'm the president so I can make rules. Well, God is saying, I'm above all of that. I make the ultimate rule. I make the ultimate way. I make the ultimate direction you should follow. So nobody is going to go and make God change his direction on the, his decision to show mercy to you. Nobody has the rule. Nobody can take God to court. No judge can change God's mind. No God, no judge can overthrow God. No, you know, nothing can be, be said where God can be found out of order and thrown out of court or dismissed. Why? Because he's the Lord of Lords. He's the ultimate way maker. And we all should follow his way because he is the Lord. And it says, why? For his mercy endureth forever. When God forgives, nobody's going to make God take it back. Now, that don't mean that the devil's not trying. Of course he tries. The Bible says that the devil accuses us day and night before God. The devil is the greatest tattletale. He's the greatest uh, 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 rumor spreader. He's the greatest gossiper that ever was. That's why those things are so awful and so, and so uh, tragic when people do that because that's in the nature of Satan. And Satan is always gossiping and tattletelling on everybody. And when you do wrong, you can, you can be assured the devil is trying to let God know, just like he tried to do with Job and with so many others we see, as we see through Scripture. When we get a glimpse into the spiritual realm, when the Scripture shows us these things, how, devil, how the devil's always accusing. Well, God's not paying any attention to that because he doesn't need to. And, he, and there's no threat to God. God is not struggling at all with, with Satan. Satan is not a, a, a match. And so therefore, we can give thanks. Why? Because God is the Lord of Lords. He's going to make a way and nobody can change the way that he makes. So then he's decided to give mercy Mercy will endure forever. Look at verse 4. It says, To him who alone doth great wonders, for his mercy endureth forever. Now, what does that mean? 
That means that the God, God of gods, the Lord of lords, the God that is good, can do things that nobody else can do. He is singular in what he can do. And God doesn't need assistance from anybody else to do what he does. Why? Because God is God without anything else. He's God all by himself. He is the great I am when there is nothing else. If you serve God, he's still God. If you choose to turn your back on God, he's still just as much God as he's always been and always will be. There is no changing in him. He's So then there is an aspect of him being uh, uh, great because he can do things all by himself that nobody else can do. He works wonders. Man. And that's an important aspect. And because he does that, we can rest assured, as it concludes in verse 4, once again, for his mercy endureth forever. Why? Because he can do things that nobody else... Well, I don't see how God's going to show mercy to this. I don't understand. This, you don't know what this person did. Right? This, this, his mercy endureth forever. He's Lord of lords. He's God of gods. He is the good God. He can do that which is impossible. That's why... No matter what a person has done, the answer to everything is go to God. Go to God. And watch. Now, if you go to him with a, with a true and just heart, there's no telling what God can do. I think about Jesus when he was talking to the woman at the well. And, and he told the woman to go, uh, where is thy husband? And she said, I don't have a husband. And he said, you answered right because you have had what? five husbands, and the one you're with now is not your husband. So he knew, but yet, what was he doing talking to her? Showing her mercy. Remember the woman that was taken in adultery? What was he doing with her? He said, woman, where are thy accusers? Because he told the crowd, he said, ye that are without sin, cast the first stone. And they all walked away. And then Jesus said to the woman, where are your accusers? And he said, there's none, Lord. He said, I don't accuse you either. Go and sin no more. His mercy in action. When Peter denied him, his mercy in action. When, his, when, when, when all of his disciples ran away and left him when he was captured, his mercy in action. God's mercy endureth forever. Now, we can take this and apply it to ourselves. No matter how how you know far back in your mind you can go and think about some of the stuff that, that that you and I we may have done, and you can just go, wow, you know what, that was pretty bad. Uh, but then God's mercy what endure forever. That's why you can come to Him, right? and you can do it, and then you can ask God to renew your mind, renew your thinking, so you don't have the appetite to do the things that you were doing in the past, and you can make a change. And you can turn from sin and turn from the, the appetite or the lust of it. All right? Why? Because his, his mercy endureth forever. Not that you're ever going to be perfect, not until Jesus comes and you receive your new body, you are transformed. But while you're living here, you're going to still have some ups and downs. You're going to still have some, some bad days. You're going to still have some bad thinking and some bad actions, some bad decisions. But his mercy endureth forever. But you've got to love God and want to do what God uh, has written out in his word. You've got to allow God to be Lord. And you've got to follow him on purpose. I'm trying to follow God. Don't follow your own appetite. Don't follow your own ways. Follow God. Now, in following God, you're still going to deviate. You're still going to make wrong turns. You're still going to get up on the wrong exit. But the minute you get up, on, what do you do if you're driving down south and you get up on the wrong exit? You loop around and get back on. Amen. The same thing with God. Why? Because his mercy endureth forever. Right? Could you imagine if you got off got off the exit and they said, well, since you got off, we're not letting you back on. That, that's, that would be, a, you'd be like, man, that's a pretty bad highway system they got. But God is not like that. And thank God uh, uh, we can consider the fact that God will always work with us and on us. Now, with that being said, don't try to be slick. 
Don't try to be conniving. Don't try to out, outplay and out, out, out uh, uh, move, maneuver God. Because God, we're talking about his mercy. In the next chapter, next week, we're going to talk about his judgment. So you need to understand that God's judgment will show up for those who try to play with God. Don't do that. Let God's mercy just engulf you and, and wipe and cleanse you from all stuff. But don't say, well, since God can cleanse me and his mercy endure forever, I'm going to take advantage of that and I'm going to do whatever I want to do and just fall back on the mercy of God. No, you're not. You're going to fall back on, on some hard rocks. You're going to fall right back into hell. You don't want to play that game because God cannot be maneuvered. You can't con God. Now, you can make mistakes and you can fall short, but don't try to manipulate the Lord. You don't want to do that. Now, you're going to be in that same kind of class as Balaam and Korah and all of those that try to do that. They try to, to use God like their own personal wishing genie. I want God to do what I want him to do. The things I can't do, I want God to do it. <clears throat> and they're trying to control God. So they're trying, they are trying to be Lord and trying to get God to follow them. That's backwards. And God is not going to honor you in that. All right? And no matter how many good things you do trying to manipulate to get God to do something that you want him to do, you're going about it the wrong way. And that's why Jesus said to those individuals, he said, Lord, haven't we done all these wonderful works in your name? Yeah, you did them in my name, but you did it for your own self. You did it for your sake. And that's why he said to them, I will say to those individuals, depart from me, you worker of iniquity. What does that iniquity mean? You weren't doing, you weren't following me. You were taking what I can do and what my name stands for and doing what you wanted to do for your own glory. And that's why Jesus said to them, depart from me. I never knew you. You never came right. You never stand up properly. You were never part of my, my, my fold. Jesus said, uh, my, my sheep know my voice, and another they will not follow. So that's important to keep in mind. So he's going to do wonders. Um, when I say wonders, I mean way above that which you can even think. All right? But just don't try to play with God. That's the point. I want, I want to nail that down. That Sometimes people get to that, that point where they think they can do that. All right? Let's look at the, let's see Sharma coming in. Good to see you. We're on Psalms. Hello. Hello. We're on Psalms 136. We're just now getting to verse 5. Okay. And so it says, To him that uh, uh, by wisdom made the heavens, for his mercy endureth forever. Now, this is another aspect about God. His wisdom. His ability to, to understand the complicated circumstances. We're going to need that wisdom next week when we read Psalms 137. Because 137 has some very interesting statements in there. You're like, man, we, I, don't know how to, I don't know how to answer this. And we're going to feel like, do we need to defend God? No, God can, God can defend himself. But we can give explanation as to what we think. But that's for next week. But the point I'm making is God's wisdom is just that deep. He can give you things to do that will pass your own understanding. Why? Because it's the wisdom of God. You know, and I often tell, uh, uh, talk about the wisdom of, uh, that God had with the women when they went to the tomb. They went to the tomb, not by knowledge, not because they, they added up the circumstances or because they understood uh, uh, the uh, practicality of it. Because from a practical standpoint, they were, they were not supposed to be successful. Number one, in order to get to their, because they were going to go put the spices on the body. In order to do that, practically, they would have had to have gotten past the guards. Because there were guards there. They would have also had to have gotten, the, had the ability to move that big stone. That would take several strong big men to move. So from a logical standpoint, they're talking about, we're going to go put the spices on the body of Jesus. That was not logical and it wasn't practical. But they didn't walk in logic, nor did they walk in practicality. They walked by faith. And they just walked knowing that I can do it from in their wisdom. They knew this is what I'm, I'm supposed to do. And they're going to do it. And when God oftentimes 
gives you wisdom, it will pass the ability for somebody to figure it out. Why did you do that? Why did you decide to do that instead of this? Most people would have done that, but you didn't. I'm following the wisdom of God. God made it clear to me I needed to go here. And God's wisdom is, is way above ours. It passes our understanding. And because of that God's wisdom, no matter what anybody tries to bring logically or, or, or practically, you know, they try to act, well, God can't forgive this. And God cannot show mercy here. God's wisdom. And that's the whole concept of the devil. He, he was thinking that if he can get man to sin, that God would not redeem man. Well, God said, I'm going to redeem him. Then he said, well, if I can just, uh, 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 you know, just keep man in sin, there's no man that's ever going to be able to live in the world that the devil is working in. And he's going to make sure that everybody sins. Nobody's going to be able to be redeemed. But what the devil didn't count on was God himself coming. In the form of man, sinful flesh, and redeeming man that way. So the wisdom of God is deep. And that's why it's important, like I had stated before, don't play with God. I don't care how smart you are. If you think you're playing chess, you're going to, out, you're going to be in checkmate before you realize it. All right? Because God don't play like that. You know, you, you come trying to outsmart him. How are you going, how are you going to outsmart him? We're going to get to this whole aspect about what he is in a little bit here. All right? But this is why we can have confidence that his mercy will endure forever because nobody's going to outsmart him. Let's keep going. Uh, verse 2. I'm sorry, verse 6. No. Verse 6. To him that stretched out the earth above the waters for his mercy endure forever. Now, so we already talked about his wisdom and his wonders that he can do. All right, so he made the earth and stretched it out and, and had the land over the, uh, 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 to come out from the seas. God did that. He created the earth. He created the universe. He created this, uh, everything that we see. All right? Where did he get the materials from? See, when, you got, when you're going to build a house, see, I say, I'm going to build me a shed. I got to go down either to the forest and cut it down myself, or I got to go out to like Home Depot or Lowe's and get me some wood. So when God decided to build the earth and he decided to, to spread forth the water, where did he get the materials? So you can't answer that. We don't know. It's just because God can be God and do things that are above what are above. So if he can do that, how much confidence can we have that his mercy will endure forever? This is the God that can create an earth and built water and have it upon the earth and create the universe. So if God can do that, we can have confidence then that his mercy. And what is this supposed to do? What is this psalm supposed to help us to realize? When God forgives you, you are what? Okay. Forgiven. His mercy. I'm going to show mercy to you. You deserve to be punished, but I'm not going to punish you. That's what, that's what God's mercy is saying. So now, what does that mean? You can relax in the presence of God. You know, sometimes when you do bad and somebody says, well, that's okay, but you still kind of feel kind of like, yeah, man, I, I just feel bad. I, I, I wish I hadn't done that. And they tell you, oh, it's okay. It's all right. Well, from God's standpoint, he's letting you know it's all right. But he's going to be able to take the guilt from you and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Right? And that's why in the book of Revelation, he said that when we, when we get there, he's going to do what? Wipe every tear from our eyes. Nobody's going to have regret. In another portion of the scripture, it says that everything that we have suffered here, when we get into heaven, we'll look back and go, it was not even worthy to be compared <laughs> to the glory that I have here. Amen. So don't worry about it. God's got it. The same God that created the earth is the same God that's going to show you mercy. All right? You may think that's not enough. Let's keep reading. Let's see what else God... Look at verse 7. To him that made great lights for his mercy endure forever. God made light so you can see. In other words, perception. 
the ability to be able to see. Now, I'm going to make sure that I make a distinction here that it's the, it's the ability of perception, not just the light from the sun and the moon, because we're going to get to that in a minute. We haven't gotten there yet. And if you remember, in the book of Genesis, God said the first thing when there was darkness upon the, the, uh, the earth, he said, let there be what? Light. light. Let there be light. Now, he said, let there be light before he made the sun, the moon, and the stars. So light was God's light of illumination has always been available and is still available to this very day. Now, what does illumination do? It helps you see the truth. When you walk in darkness, you can't see what's in front of you. So if the enemy has laid a trap for you and you're walking in darkness, you can step into the trap. You can, you can uh, stump your feet. You can fall into the, into the ditch or to, into the pothole because it's too dark. It's like the guy that, that went hiking and, and got caught out in the, in the night and knew he couldn't get back. So he decided to go into a cave and he slept there all night. He slept in this cave and he was just sleeping in there. He was just, you know, fell asleep. When he woke up the next morning and the light shined in the cave, he realized he was not in a good place because inside that cave was bats, snakes, lizards, spiders, and, all, and he didn't realize how much danger he was in. Until what? Until the light shined. And that's how we are sometimes. Sometimes we have no idea what kind of stuff is around our life until God's light shines in. And then when God's light shines in, you be like, wow, I've been living in this kind of uh, circumstances with all this stuff around me all this time. And God's like, yeah, so you need to do what? Get away from it. And there's times when God's light shines on you and you recognize, I need to get up and get away from here. I'm not going to spend another night in this place. Not with all this danger in here. And God's light and his illumination can help you get yourself to a better place. And that's an important aspect about the walk with God. Let's keep going. Now look at verse uh, 8. The sun ruled by day for his mercy endureth for night, uh, 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 forever. And uh, let me include verse 9. And the moon and the stars rule by night for his mercy endureth forever. What are we talking about here? It's talking about now the aspect of how light can be visually uh, uh, actually seen as a source. I know where the source is. All right. God has given the light to be the ruler by the sun for day, the stars and the moon for the ruler by night. I now have a source. I recognize what God has implemented. I know where God has put it. And that's an important thing, too, because we know where God has put his truth. We know where God has put his light. Jesus says, I am the, I am the light of the world. We know where God put it. It's in the word of God. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. So just like he gave the light to the sun, the light was also, and we knew we know where the sun is. The sun's coming, uh, 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 rising in the, in, in the morning and setting in the night as the earth rotates around it. Well, we know where the light of God is. It's in the word of God. It's in his son. So sometimes it's important enough. There are times when you just don't know what's going on. But sometimes God says, I'm going to show you the source. I will show you where you need to go and what you need to do. Now, here's the thing. Are you going to do it? Because see, when you got to go plant crops and it's nighttime, you can't do it. But you know that the sun is going to rise when? In the morning. Mm -hmm. Now, Jesus said, when, uh, um, when it's daytime, that is when it is time to do what? Uh, to do the work. Because when night comes, no one can work. So you got to recognize the source, the season, the timing. That's what the sun and the moon and the stars help us do. So we can begin to govern and plan and set forth our life. I'm going to work according to when I know the sun will be here. And I'm going to utilize it. And right now, this is what we're doing now. We're planting 
the word of God, we're planting the seed of the word in us by going through the word of God. There may come a day when it will become night when we will not be able to do this. And therefore, you got to do it while it is day. Work while it is day because the night will come and no man will be able to work. So while you can do it, do it. Put the word of God in you. Plant the seed. And you, you'll recognize that God will give you that opportunity. Why does God give you that? Because his mercy endureth forever. So not only does he cleanses you, forgives you, but he also helps to do what? Grow you. He will plant the word of God in you. And you got to plant it in you while it is day, while you have the light, while you're walking uh, in uh, the ability to perceive and to see. There will come spiritual dark, dark times, which we're going to see here in a minute, when it gets difficult to see. But that don't mean it stops God. It's just that now you, you can't, you don't see the way. You got to now continuously lean on God because God's going to make a way out of no way. These are going to tap back into that verse 4 where he talks about his wonders. But let's get to it. <clears throat> Look at verse 10. To him that smote Egypt, uh, the, 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 that smote uh, Egypt in their firstborn, for his mercy endures forever. So this goes back all the way back to the Exodus uh, story when uh, they were servi in servitude under Egypt and the oh. death angel came and anyone that was um, in the house oh, yeah. and did not have what? The blood on the doorpost, the death angel came and the firstborn died. Mm. All right. Now, what does this mean here? <clears throat> it says to him that smote Egypt in their firstborn. That means that there is an aspect of God that will protect you when the death angel is going about. When the death angel shows up, what does that mean? It means death. Yeah. It's going, you're going, the death angel is basically there to collect his, his wages. The wages of sin is what? Debt. Death. When a, when, a, when a debt collector comes to your house, he's looking to get what? I'm, I'm, I'm time, it's time to get paid. I need the wages. And when God sent the death angel into Egypt, everybody had to pay up. That was old. And what God determined was anyone that was not covered by the blood over the doorpost had to pay. And the payment that particular day was your firstborn. And that's a, that was a bad night. That was not a good night. But even though that happened, there was mercy because not every firstborn died. There were firstborns that did not die because they did what? They trusted in the word of God. Put the blood over the doorpost, sit in the house, stay in there, don't go out. And a death angel will do what? Pass over you. Right? That's God's mercy. Because see, the death angel is not coming as a, a tyrant or something. He's coming because you owe something. You do owe him. You have a bill. He's not coming to rob you. The death angel didn't come to, to rob folks. He came to collect the debt. And sometimes people get mad and they say, well, I don't see why God allowed that to come there. And he did. It's because that is the sentence. The wages of sin is death. And if we don't have God's mercy, we're going to have to pay that. And that day, God sent the debt collector, which we call the death angel. He called the death angel. He went out to collect the debt. <clears throat> These folks owe. And they had to pay. But there was still God's mercy. mercy. And there was those who did not have to pay. Boy, we need that, don't we? Yes. We definitely need that. Verse 11. And brought out Israel from among them for his mercy endure forever. So then God says, now, this is a place. Egypt was a place because Egypt is a type of sin. I sin. And so what God is saying, I'm going to bring you out of this sinful type. I'm going to move you out of that. And that's what God does for us. When, you, when we were, before we get to know God, 
we have a mindset of doing what we want to do, the way we want to do it, how we want to do it. Uh, there's a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Why are they the ways of death? Because they're sinful. And the wages of sin is death. So when you're doing your own thing, you're, you're doing that outside of the will of God, which means you're sinning. You have missed the mark. Well, I ain't trying to do nothing wrong. No, but it doesn't matter whether you're trying to do anything wrong or right. If you're not lined up with God, then you're not lined up with him. So you have to line up with God. God says that, that there is a way. All right, But that way is Jesus. You can't go any other way. And Jesus said there is no other way to the Father except through him. Well, I'm going to get to the Father by being nice. That's not going to do it. Well, I'm going to get to the Father by being uh, uh, just being a, 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 a kind person. I'm going to share my wealth of my time. That ain't going to do it. Well, I'm just going to be the biggest, strongest, baddest. That ain't going to do it either. It's only Jesus. That's the only way. And so we got to recognize that, that there is a way to the Father and to eternal life. Thank God for that. Why is there a way? Because his mercy endureth forever. Okay? Uh, verse 12. With a strong hand and a, and a stretched out arm, for his mercy endureth forever. Now, what does that mean? It means that God was able to bring uh, Israel out of Egypt because he is mighty. We talked about that earlier. He's the Lord of Lords. He's the God of gods. He can do the one, he can do wonders. He's strong. He's powerful. He's almighty. Almighty God. And so with a strong hand and a stretched out arm. Now, those are very, very uh, 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 contrasting aspects. He's stretching out the arm. Imagine you stretching out an arm trying to help a child. And with your other strong arm, you're holding off a vicious dog. So you got one hand grabbing the dog and you're keeping him from getting to the child. And you're holding the other child to protect it. In your other arm. One arm is showing the mercy. The other arm is showing the strength. One is stretched out and one is strong. That's how God protects us. The devil's trying to get to us and God is smacking the devil back every time. But he's also holding us. The devil comes as what? As a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And with God's strong hand, he resists the devil. And it's no big deal because God's hand is this, just that strong. But with his other hand, he has it stretched out to who? To you and me. So we can come to God. He says, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. And I, I will give you what? And give you rest. Give you rest. rest. And God has that for us. Amen. So I thank God for that. And why is he using his strong hand and his stretched out arm? Because he's that merciful. That's how merciful he is. Look at verse 13. To him that which divide the Red Sea into parts, his mercy Ooh. endureth forever. He takes the sea and divide it. That's a miracle. I don't care how which way you want to stretch it. I don't care how you want to talk about it. <laughs> That's a miracle. God now can do things. He can make a way out of no way. He can open up a door where there is no door. Ooh. Well, we're going we gonna, we gonna to walk on to blessing. Well, there's a there's a there's a sea there. Now keep in mind, the it says it's the Red Sea. This ain't the Red Stream or the Red Brook, or not even the Red River. This is the Red Sea. And they walk through that. That's a that's opening a door for you to go through that nobody else could have opened. Only God. Now, what does that mean? God's mercy is so good, He can make a way, a plan, an escape, a means for you that nobody else could have done. Nor could anybody else expect it that that was the way you were going to get blessed. That was the way you were going to go through it. And yet, you're in the midst of trouble. The, the Red Sea needed to be open because they had an Egyptian army behind them coming with, with swords and chariots and, and spears and looking to do what? To kill. And to capture and to enslave. So they were in the midst of trouble, but God opened up a door. Why? 
because he is that merciful. He can open up a door where you could not imagine. I had no idea that we were going to escape through the sea when he divided it. All right? And he and 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 uh, look at verse 14. And made Israel to pass through the midst of it for his mercy endure forever. Now, here's the thing. God opens up the door for you. But God's going to have to give you courage to walk through it. Amen. See, if you open up that door, I mean, imagine somebody says, well, I just made a door right through the red, right through the uh, Hudson River. And that's just a river. And when you look on the left and look on the right, you see river. And in between, you see some dry ground. And I said, go ahead and walk it. Like, well, who's, what's, what's holding this together? Can you give me a, schem a, a schematic as to what's... No, just walk it. You got to do that by what? Faith. By faith. faith. You got to have faith. And so even to walk, even though the door was made, and that's something we have to understand, sometimes God will make a door for us to get through and to get away from our trouble that's so remarkable, we can be afraid to walk through it. And we need God's help and his grace and his mercy to be able to do what? To walk into the provisions and to the blessings that he's offering to us. Sometimes it's, it's hard to do things that God has provided because God provides things that are so wonderful, unbelievable. We could not even believe God could do that. All right? And look at verse 15. But overthrew Pharaoh and his host in the Red Sea for his mercy endured forever. Now, Israel had faith. The nation, then they decided to do what? Walk through the Red Sea. They believed God. They followed Moses right on through. Pharaoh said, well, if they can do it, I can do it too. No, no, no. This was for God's people. And so Pharaoh tried to walk through the same door that God made for Israel. Pharaoh walked into the door, but he didn't come out on the other side. Why? Because God's mercy endures forever. Those who were trying to come into your blessing and overtake you in the midst of your blessing, while you're in the midst of God blessing you, they're coming in to curse you. God closed up the Red Sea on the Pharaoh and, and, his, and his army. Why? Because God's mercy endured forever. Was Israel perfect? Were they a perfect people? Were they a perfect nation? No. What did they then receive? Mercy. Because they cried and called upon God. And God heard their cry. And God was merciful. And God had told even Abraham beforehand, because God knows all things. He told Abraham, I'm going to make out of you a great people. And so when he brought Israel out of Egypt, that was now a new nation. That was them being born as a nation of God, called out of Egypt, called out of sin, going through the Red Sea, because his mercy endured forever. All right? Now, it's wonderful when you see the miracles of God bringing you through the Red Sea. Let's, let's look at this next portion here. We're, we're going to still need God's mercy. Look at verse um, 16. To him which led his people through the wilderness for his mercy endure forever. Now, we, we just read that and we go, we say, okay, he read, led him through the wilderness. But if you guys remember when we went through the books of Moses, we went through Exodus and, and Numbers and Leviticus and Deuteronomy, we, went, we watched all of that stuff happen. That was a, a, a monumental task going through the wilderness. Why? Because it's a wilderness. It didn't say through the civilization, through the city, or through the, the, you know, the, the wonderful towns. It was a wilderness that they had to go through. And when they did come across other nations, which we'll see here in a minute, those other nations were hostile. And so, what? once again... We need God's will, uh, 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 mercy in the wilderness. Now, how does the wilderness portray us? We talked about this many times when we were going through the books of Moses. But the wilderness is you're at a place where you don't have the resources you need to do what you need to do. You are low on resources. 
I don't have the good I don't have the best car, I don't have the best house, I don't got the best job, I don't got the best health. My resources are low. I'm in a wilderness. But guess who's there with you? God. Why? Because his mercy endureth forever. And they learned more about who God was in the wilderness than they did when they got to the land of milk and honey. It's sad to say. They got to the land of milk and honey and lost their mind. Why? Because things were wonderful. But in the wilderness, boy, you get close to God. His mercy endureth forever. Verse 17. To him which smote great kings for his mercy endureth forever. All right? And like I said, they walked through the wilderness. Every now and then they would come to a, a, a town or a settlement where they were great kings that have established themselves. All right? But he was able to allow them to, to smoke the great kings. In other words, he put them to death. He, he put an end to those kings. And he's going to talk about a few of those kings now. Look at verse 18. And slew famous kings for his mercy endureth forever. Let's keep going. Verse 19. Uh, Sihon, king of, Am of the Amorites, for his mercy. And we go back to Ammon. All right. Anytime you uh, think of Ammon, we can follow Ammon all the way back to Sodom and Gomorrah. Why? Because Ammon was one of the children born to Lot's daughters when Lot's daughters, when Lot and his daughters came out of Sodom and Gomorrah. And so, and, and, and Moab. And Ammon were the two children that the, that the daughters had when they got the father drunk and they slept with the father to produce the children because they were so uh, afraid and thinking God can't bless any old other kind of way. And they had to walk by what they can see. Walking by sight is dangerous because that's all that they could see, the, the, the daughters of, of, of Lot. All they could see was, well, all we see as a man here is our father. So on a, on, in order for us to have a... Uh, uh, offspring, we're going to have to get him drunk and, and get impregnated by him. Walking by sight can make you do some dumb things. That's why the Bible says we walk by faith, not by hey. sight. You see it on the news. You see it on you know, a lot of our, our TV shows. The reason why the TV shows are successful is because we watch people that walk by sight. You struggling. You don't have a lot of money. But you got a husband or you got a wife. What do they do? The husband and the wife got what? Insurance money. So what do they see? They're not walking by faith. They're walking by what they can see, what they can calculate. I got $500,000 life insurance on my husband. Or I got $500,000 life insurance on my wife. And I'm broke. I'm losing. I'm about to lose my, my job and my house. What do I do? Where can I get money? And they look to see what they can do. And all they're seeing is an evil way. Well, it's true. You can see it. I see it there. That's five hundred dollars sitting over there across the table eating eating food right there. I put some poison in that food. I could turn that turn that person right there into five hundred thousand dollars. That's what they see. But what about just saying I don't see a way? There is a honorable way, a way that is not sinful. So I need to learn how to walk by what faith. <laughs> If you continue to walk by sight, you end up doing things that you shouldn't do. Right? I mean, there's, there's another way. People say, well, you know, I need some money. I'm going to go play every lotto I can find. And I'm not, you know, there's people that play that. And, you know, I, I, don't, I don't endorse that. But I, I'm not going to criticize and beat nobody up for doing it either. But that's all they can see. That's all I'm going to go. I'm going to put $100,000 every week on it. And they've been playing it for 20 years and ain't won yet. Now, they'll say, well, but you got to be in it to win it. And there are some people that win it. That's true. But how about walking by faith? Walking by faith is, is not as, as, as tangible as just, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go do what I can see. But the problem with doing what you can see, a lot of times, it's integrated with a lot of evil. So walking by faith is really the way to go. And so when you're going out and you're dealing with these strong kings, they're bigger than us. They, got, they, they are established. They already have a city. They have weapons. They got warriors. They got an army. We just now coming out of Egypt. We, we don't have any of that. 
but God's mercy gave them the what? Gave them the victory. Yeah. All right. And so, and then you can also see in verse 20, and Og, king of Bashan. And we talked about Og, how they, Og, you take Og all the way back to Genesis chapter 6, when the angels came down and they slept with the women of men and produced great giants. Mm -hmm. All right. And so Og goes all the way back to them, to that. And that still kind of stuck around here and there. And that's why you always had, from time to time, giants in the land. And when God brought them through the wilderness, they came across some giants. But God gave them the victory. Okay? And so, you know, you can get, a, get over all of these different things, no matter what is their so-called uh, stronghold, God gave you the victory. Why does he give you the victory? Because you're better, you're stronger, you're smarter? No. God is showing you what? Mercy. Mercy. Okay. Verse 21. And gave their land for an inheritance for his mercy endure forever. The, 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 uh, the child of God will inherit the earth. Who's going to earn the earth? Who, who, who's going to uh, 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 rule, not rule, who's going to uh, be uh, redeemed and live and, and have uh, 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 citizenship on the new heaven, in the new heaven and on the new earth and in the new Jerusalem? The child of God. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. All right, they're going to always be what God is. All right, they shall, they, we shall inherit the earth. earth. All right, and so we're going to have that. Uh, verse 22. Even the heritage unto Israel, his servant. And therein is the key. I, I highlighted that, underlined that. That servant. Make sure that you see God as Lord and that you are servant. Most people, I know, let me rephrase that. Some people see God as my kind of genie in a bottle. God can do things I can't do, but I'm, I'm going to tell God what I want done. And I expect God to do it versus us doing what God wants to do. We got to learn to say, like Jesus said in this prayer, uh, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I need to find out what the will of God is and align myself with that. That's how you get your prayers answered. Your prayer has to be in the same line as Jesus, same line as the Holy Spirit, same line as the Father. If your prayers are out of that line, you're not praying uh, in the will of God. And those prayers are not answered. So a lot of times people think, well, I'm going to change God, you know, because prayer changes things. Prayer don't change God. <laughs> prayer will change you. <laughs> Right? And so that's why. So when you say prayer changes things, that's true. The thing that is changing is you. It yeah. helps you to align up with the will of God. And now your heart and your desire and your thinking is now lined up with God. And if the Bible says if, if, if God be in you and you be in God, then you can ask what you will and it shall be done unto you. But if you're not in him and he's not in you, like James said, your prayer and your prayers are not answered because you pray amiss. Yes. You're trying to put your prayer upon your lust. That's what James said. And as James said, that's why you're not going to get the answer to your prayer. All right? So it's an important thing. All right? And so um, Israel is a servant. We are a servant. Verse 23. Who remembereth us in our low estate for his mercy endureth forever. God knows your problems. He remembers us in our low state. When you're crying, when you don't see a way out, when you're confused, when you don't know what's going on, when you're heartbroken, in your low estate, when you don't understand why, why is this happening? When you're like, why me, God? All of that stuff, God's with you. His mercy is right there with you. He's allowing you to feel that. That's why it's important. I tell people a lot of times, you got a problem, you feel bad, you feel sad, tell God. Get, let him know how, how low you feel about a certain particular. I don't think, I don't understand why. Say it. Get it out. You know why? Because God already knows it anyway. So if your heart is broken about something and you confuse, tell God. 
Now, when it's all said and done, always remember that God is God. He's sovereign. And you got to change your will. You're the one that's got to make the adjustment. I got to line up with you guys. Help me. Help me to line up with you. Because right now I feel out of place. And that's fine when you feel that way. But tell God. Let him know. And say, I need to be lined up with you. Help me to get there. And God will do it. You'd be surprised how he do it. Look at verse 20, um, 24. And have redeemed us from our enemy. The Bible says the last enemy is what? Death. Death. Exactly. He's redeemed us from death. He's redeemed us from the devil. He, he's redeemed us from all of that. He's redeemed us from sin. He's also redeemed us from yourself. One of the, you know, the, the, one of the worst enemies you have is the enemy in me. <laughs> Sometimes I can be in me, my own enemy. God can redeem you from yourself. He can redeem you from all that because he's just that merciful. His mercy endureth forever. Verse 25. Who giveth food to all flesh for his mercy endureth forever. Jesus said that God will take care of your needs. He said he feeds the sparrow. He clothes the grass of the field. Will he not feed and clothe you? And then he, add, Jesus adds that phrase, O ye of what? Little faith. You, you, we don't have a lot of faith in God. We get we we break up and start crying the moment things start not going right. Let your job let your job not pay you one week. <laughs> we gonna be we gonna be crying. Now we might as well just you know you gonna you miss one expected paycheck. Tears are gonna be like well why did what happened here? You are gonna be like because you you expect that money to be there. All right. Now, all right, God is letting us know that, you know, he will, he's the provider. And, and uh, yeah, I'm not going, I'm not going to pretend and try to act all holier than now. If I look at my bank account on payday and I don't see my paycheck, I'm going to be concerned, but I got to remember Wayne, calm down, go to God because, uh, these jobs, these corporations don't rule the world. God does. It may look like they do. So I, I know I'm gonna have to, I will have to talk myself off of that spiritual ledge and say, wait a minute now. I'm going to go and try to find out what's going on, but I'm going to be going while I'm praying to God. Saying, God, what's going on here? Show me. Help me. Line me up with your will. Help me to see what you're seeing. Calm me down. Give me that peace that passes all understanding. Because I'm going to need it now. Really, I'm, I'm going to really need it. Yeah. All right? But that's where we can go. See, we have some place to go when we go into chaos, when we go into confusion. We have a place to go. The people that don't know God, they don't. And that's why a lot of them, they end up, well, I, I'm not going to get paid and all this. They, you know, go to drugs and suicide and jump off buildings. And all. I can at least, when I'm in that kind of a distress, I can go to God. I thank God for that. Because we all find ourselves in some kind of distress from time to time, every now and then, during our life. We're going to get there. If you haven't been there, you'll get there. And, if, and maybe you've already been there and you're dealing with it. All right? But you're going you're gonna to find it at some point in time. You're going to have to lean on God in those total distressful moments. All right? But then you've got to recognize God feeds all flesh. He knows what's going on. He's going to take care of my needs. I'm going, to, I'm, going to, I'm going to learn to lean on him more and more and more. Oh, that I have faith to trust him more and more. All right? That's what the song says. Our final verse. Give thanks unto God, to the God of heaven. Why? Because of everything we just read, everything we just talked about, give him thanks. For his mercy endureth forever. And that's a beautiful thing to keep in mind. And it's a beautiful thing that we can relax in uh, and try to build up in ourselves a, prep, a preparation that when difficult and tough times come, I can learn to lean on God and trust his mercy and his goodness. Now, all we talked about 
was his mercy. And we, we didn't really get too much into his grace. We didn't get too much into his, his, uh, his uh, what's that other one that I'm, what am I thinking about? His uh, favor, God's favor. We didn't talk about a lot of that stuff. But we will, as we go through all these books of praise, we're going to see some of these aspects of why we should be praising God. All right, we're going to stop there. Any comments or questions on what we talked about tonight? 